Hey, my name is Krista Smith. I'm so excited and really honored to be with all of you here at CFNI. My husband and I, we love, love, love this school, this training center that has such an incredible legacy of sending people all over the world to impact and change people carrying the gospel of Jesus. To be with you for a session, it's my privilege and I'm excited and I wanna dive right in because I feel like I have a word from the Lord. I wanna encourage you, don't view this as yet just one more thing to do on your checklist of today, but can you settle your heart and allow your mind and your spirit just to come to a place of peace and get ready with an expectancy to receive what I believe the Lord has for you today. I want to speak even to the current moment that we're in right now with COVID-19. Now, I know a lot of people have found themselves in places where they didn't expect themselves to be. Even for UCF and I students, maybe school. And I know school looks really, really different. This year already looks really different. But I want to speak hope to the current situation. The hope is this, that things might look different here in 2020, but I still know the promises of God have never been truer for a year. We've had so many prophetic years that it were that this is a year of breakthrough. This is a year of delayed promises coming to pass. This is a year that God's even going to use the detours, the interruptions. I prophesied that in January in a church in Virginia. I didn't even know fully what I was prophesying, but I heard the Lord say, this year is not about keeping your schedule. It's about getting into alignment with his presence. Friends, can I invite you to come into agreement and alignment with what God is releasing, even through these online courses, this classes, this time together. I know you've been in a detour. I have been too. I know you've been interrupted. I've been interrupted too. But I believe that when we use the interruptions that at times come to our doorstep of life, that when we come into a place of peace and rest and we wait on what God has for us in this time, I believe we can go into a deeper place of our of the presence of God and in our walk with him. I want to invite you in the time that I have, these, these short time that I have with you today, we're going to go in the presence of God. And so even right now, put the to-do list aside and let's get focused focused on the awareness that Jesus is in our midst. And friends, when Jesus is in our midst, he is going to speak to us and he's going to encounter you. Some of you need some hope today. Some of you need to be reminded that God's words are still going to come to pass this year. You had some expectations, some, some things in your heart that you knew God was releasing over you for this year in 2020. I want you to know we are only four months deep into this year. We still have eight months left. God's word is still going to come to pass. All those prophetic words, all the things that the Lord whispered into your heart coming into 2020, oh, they're still going to happen. So I want to shut the narrative of the enemy today once and for all and say fear doesn't have its way. Faith has its way today. So don't allow four for a couple months of interruption to detour you away from what God has prophesied and what he has promised. He's called you to CFNI. You're supposed to be a student at CFNI. And so I felt like as I was just waiting on the Lord about to come on and do this right now, I heard the Lord say, speak to the hearts of some of these students where you've maybe possibly been wavering. Man, this isn't what I thought it was going to look like. I want you to know you are smack dab in the middle of God's will for your life. And although it may look different, sometimes it's the detours that take you to your destiny. Amen. Okay, let's dive right in. I don't know about you, but in my walk with the Lord through the years, and I've walked with the Lord all my life, and I was blessed to be born and raised in a Christian home and by parents that really love Jesus. One thing I often experienced in my walk with God was the struggle between convenience versus being obedient. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to tell you a story that I think actually captures this principle and this truth so well. I was a director of a school of ministry in Las Vegas, Nevada, and we had an annual prophetic conference every year and a Holy Spirit conference, and there were thousands of people that would come, and it was a perfect opportunity to promote the school of ministry and use it as a recruiting opportunity to invite people to come and get trained and, and released for the call of God in their life. And so I wanted my promotion table to be done really well. I wanted my, uh, you know, it to, it to look good, you know, aesthetically pleasing, so to speak. So I was going to places like Michael and Target and whatnot, and I'm in like task mode. Have you ever been there where you're not in a spiritual state? You're just, uh, even though your spirit never goes to sleep and God's always speaking, it was like my mind was just on the task at hand. My mind was just making a great promotion table. So I go to Target and I'm looking around and I'm not finding what I want. And I, I notice the time and the time's kind of getting away from me. And I realize I'm going to be late and I still haven't, you know, found things for my table. So I'm in a hurry and I run out of Target. I'm running to my car and over on the right hand side, I hear this 
voice calling out to me saying, ma'am, ma'am. And I'm like, is someone talking to me? And I realized there is a young man about 19 to 20 years old and he's running across the parking lot to me. And, and I say, are you talking to me? And he says, I am. And he says, ma'am, ma'am, I'm sorry to bother you, but I am starving. Will you please get me a meal? And instantly my heart is like, oh Jesus, I love this. You know, I, I'm excited this young man has sought me out in a, in a public parking lot. And I look in the parking lot and there's Baja Fresh and it's across the way. And I look to the young man, I said, well, what do you like? And he says to me, I'll eat anything. I'll eat anything. And I think, well, my goodness, well, then you'll like Baja Fresh. It's like a fast food Mexican restaurant. So I, I point to it and I said, how about you walk over there? I'll meet you over there. I'll drive my car. And he said, great. And I said, I'm happy to get you a meal. We're standing in line and I tell him, of course, order whatever you want. And I ask him his name. His name is Kyle. I said, Kyle, I want you to order whatever you want. But as we're waiting, can I hear your story? How did you end up in this situation where you are starving and you don't have a meal? And he began to kind of share his story. He's dealing with addiction. He got kicked out of his house. He has some life controlling issues that were happening. And rather than get caught up in a narrative that unfortunately I've heard many times pastoring in years in major cities around the U.S., that narrative of addiction, the narrative of loss, Rather than check out, I felt like the Lord said, stay connected with the heart of the son in front of you. And the kid that is broken, lost and hurting and wanting to be taken care of, Krista, show him Jesus today. And so here's this young man and I'm just listening. I'm listening to his story. And as I'm listening to the story, I just hear the Lord begin to share with me what to speak to him. And as we get up to the counter and he's about to order, I realize I'm going to share what's on my heart for him after we order. And as soon as he gets up there, remember, I've told him, order whatever you want. And so he gets up to the counter and here's this 19 to 20 year old kid. And he's like, I'll take two tacos and a water. And I'm like, okay, you know, you're in college, you're a CFNI student. I mean, college students are always hungry, right? So I know two tacos are not going to fill up a 19 to 20 year old guy. Like, no way. So I go, no, 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 no. I said, no, I told you to get whatever you want. So order like whatever, literally order whatever you want. I was like, order the steak fajitas, like whatever, whatever would be make you happy. And I was like, do you like steak fajitas? And he's like, I, I like steak fajitas. So I was like, get the steak fajitas, get the chip and guacamole, like get the brownie at the counter, like get the grande vinte drink. I know we're not Starbucks, but I speak Starbucks, right? So I'm like, get the big drink, you know? And so I, I told this young man, you know, get whatever you want. So he kind of looked at me and he's like, okay, so he got the chips and the guac and he got the brownie, he got the big drink, he got the steak fajitas. And I'm like, eat up, right? Because there was a spiritual moment happening in the natural that I knew God wanted to show this young man, Kyle, that he was just hoping for some water and a taco, but he's about to have a steak fajito, chips and guac, brownie, grande drink kind of moment in the spirit. Because when we show up to be used by God, everything shifts and changes in one moment. So because we're at Baja Fresh and fajitas take a little longer to be cooked, I had about 10, 15 minutes with this kid and I said, hey Kyle, can I share with you my story? And I said, I know you wanted a physical meal, but I actually want to give you that. And I'm honored to do that. I actually love to give meals to people that are hungry. But more importantly than a physical meal, I want to tell you about my best friend, Jesus, who set me free, who delivered me, who encountered me and changed and marked my life forever. And he said to me, Krista, I've tried the Jesus thing. And I said, well, Kyle, I think we can both agree what you're currently doing in your life isn't working or you wouldn't be in the situation you're in. And he couldn't argue with me. And he said, okay. And so after I shared my testimony and my story, I said, would you like to give your life to Jesus? Would you like to try it again? Because I think this is a divine appointment. I don't think you asked me of all people in the target parking lot for a meal by accident. I think God set this up because he's been pursuing you and it's time to stop running. He grabbed my hands. We prayed the sinner's prayer. He got a steak fajitos. I got him connected to some resources for his life. I went to my car and I praised God for a divine encounter and a divine appointment. Well, then I go back into task mode. Remember, I'm doing the whole promotion table for the school of ministry. So I drive about 10 minutes away and I go to Michael's and I'm, I'm back in task mode. I'm excited about what just happened, but I still got some things to do. I look through Michael's. I can't find anything again. I quickly, again, I'm running late to a meeting and I run out and all of a sudden I hear a voice again off to my right hand side. 
And I hear this voice say, ma'am, ma'am. And I look over and I see a figure sitting on the curb of, a, of, of the sidewalk and he's sitting there and I can't tell if it's male, female, the hoodies over the head, face is covered. And I go over there and I say, are you speaking to me? And, and again, this young man then looks up at me. He's 19 to 20 years old. And he says, ma'am, ma'am, I'm so hungry. I'm starving. Can you get me a meal? And I said, well, I am so glad that you asked me of all people to get you a meal because I asked Jesus to bring people into my path that are hungry. So I would love to get you some food. And in this parking lot, there's only a gas mini mart. And I said, would you like to go over there? He said, I'm not allowed in there. And I said, okay, well, if you promise to wait here, I'll go get you something. He said, I promise to wait here. I said, what's your name? He said, my name is David. I quickly go over to the convenience market. The Lord says, as soon as I walk in the convenience market, he says, don't just get him a little sandwich and a granola bar and a drink, like get a bag from the cashier and fill up the bag because the Lord says, I'm not just a couple of snacks. I'm not just a granola, granola, granola bar kind of God. I'm not a two taco God. He says, I'm a fill the bag up. I'm a more than enough God. I'm going to come in in a place where they're expecting just a little and I'm going to bring them a lot because I'm a God that lavishes. So I grab this bag and I fill it up and I'm like doing prophetic shopping. I'm not kidding. I'm like, okay, Jesus, what does he like? And I was like, he doesn't like that. He likes this. He doesn't like that. So I mean, I'm just like prophetically filling up this bag, but I feel the heart of Jesus for this kid to love him and, to, and for him to know that he is seen and known by the father. So I'm trying to hurry because I'm really praying he really does stick around. I run out there and there's David sitting on the curb still. I go sit by David. I said, David, what's going on? I said, how did you end up here today? What happened? And he began to share his story of addiction and struggles. And he too was kicked out of his home. And I'm realizing friends that in a 15 minute span, maybe 20 minute span, I'm having an identical conversation with two young men, 19 to 20 years old, homeless, addicted, starving, and they've asked me for a meal. Both of them told me when I asked them, what do they want to eat? They both said they would eat anything. And I'm sitting here like I was sitting with Kyle. I'm sitting with David and I'm looking at the face of David and I'm asking him what his story is. And as he shares the story, I say, can I share with you my story? He says, yes. And I begin to share with him my story about how I encountered Jesus, how he marked me, delivered me, set me free. And I've been changed ever since because of who Jesus is in my life. And I found David listening to this. And I said, I think it's time that you encounter the Jesus I'm talking about. And he says, well, Chris, I've tried Jesus before and it didn't work for me. He said the same thing Kyle said. Well, I responded exactly back to what I had said to the previous young man. I said, well, I think we can both agree what you're doing in your life right now isn't working. So I think that this appointment, this encounter is merely a pursuit of the father over your heart. I think it's time that you ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior once again. And so he agreed. We grabbed hands and sitting on the curb. And in in again, a 15, 20 minute span, span I, I pray the sinner's prayer with David. And here again, a young man gives his life to Jesus. I'm wrecked. I'm marked. And after that moment, I praise Jesus. I go back to my car and I'm sitting there and I said, Jesus, I know I've just experienced a prophetic moment. I know I've experienced a crazy encounter. It was the exact same conversation with two young men. And I said, Lord, but I know I'm not seeing the fullness of what you're trying to communicate to me. And in that moment, I heard the Lord say, I just showed you the appetite of a generation that is starving for an encounter. They will eat anything that is given to them because they are so hungry. He says, but I'm looking for my disciples. I'm looking for my followers that will feed a generation that is starving. They'll eat anything, but I want to bring them my truth. I want to bring them the bread of life. He says, will you bring, will you be one that brings a generation the truth and the gospel of Jesus. And I sat there, friends, in my car with tears streaming down my face. And I raised my hands in my little car. And I said, oh God, use me. Bring the hungry to me. Bring the broken to me. Bring the ones that are struggling, the ones that have lost sight of who they are, that are homeless, that are addicted, that have lost identity. Oh God, I'll bring them not just a physical meal, but I'll bring them an encounter with you.
Why am I sharing that story with you of all stories today? I'm sharing with you that story because of the principle of obedience versus convenience. See, had I been so focused, remember, on my task of creating the perfect promo table. See, friends, we can promote Jesus, but it's so much better to be Jesus. That day, it wasn't about setting up a table to recruit people to a school of ministry. It was about living the gospel of Jesus in that moment, willing to be inconvenienced. I was late to meetings. I was broke at that time of my life, especially some of you can relate to that. I promise you, I think I had $8 and like 83 cents in my, in my checking account at that time. I'm using cash of my own cash, my own grocery money. And I'm not doing, it's telling you that to promote myself. I'm simply saying it was inconvenient to love on these kids. It took my time. It took my resources. It took a moment to hear their story to get dirty, to sit on the curb. But friends, that's when the encounter happens, when you're willing to be inconvenienced. The inconveniences are life, the detours, the interruption, exactly where we're at right now, COVID-19. We have been interrupted. We have been inconvenienced. Friends, this is the perfect setup for an encounter with God. I want you to know that when you embrace the detours, when you embrace the surprises, the prophetic utterances of heaven that come to your life, that is when the encounters happen. It is in that moment that I honestly feel like I got marked to bring revival and the gospel of Jesus to a generation. I got insight into the heart of a generation that was starving. It would not have happened had I not been willing to be inconvenienced, to go to a place that maybe I didn't plan for, but I could tell God was setting me up for. And with that, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Ruth 1. Today, I want to talk to you about someone that we often all know, especially those that have been in Bible college or training school of any time. We know about Ruth, but today I pray that my hope is I bring something to you a little bit different, something that will, I believe, show a different perspective of this story. And I believe it so connects to what God's saying in this hour. I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version this today, and I, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 1, starting verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Imelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malan and Chilion of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and they remained there. And then Imelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. Now, her two sons took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was or Orpah and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there for about 10 years. Then both Malion and Chilion also died. So the, so the woman, Naomi, survived her two sons and her husband. Let's now read verse eight. Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness of you as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye. They wept out loud and they said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have two more sons who would become your husband? Re return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept out loud again. And then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods, little G. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn my back on you. Wherever you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Friends, 
Here's three women that have lost everything. Their future is bleak. They're vulnerable. Their future is unknown. They have no idea what's ahead of them. They had a plan they, that was going to look one way. When Naomi and Imelech had moved to Moab with their two sons, they had an expectation. They had a life, dreams that they were building, things that they thought were going to come to pass. Then Naomi loses her husband unexpectedly. And then tragedy strikes once again. And now her two sons are killed and she's left with two Moabite daughter-in-laws. She's a foreigner in this land and she finds herself vulnerable. She finds herself in a crossroad moments, in a crisis situation. And all three of these women, not only are they vulnerable, they are dependent on the wealth or the welfare and the benevolence of their family and friends in order for them to survive and be okay. See, the livelihood for a woman in those times, in biblical times, was based on her husband. If a woman did not have a husband, she did not have a livelihood. And so because when the husbands died, it represents their livelihood dying. So here's Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws. They're literally at a crossroad moments to having to decide what do we do when we find ourselves in the unexpected, when we find ourselves in the crisis, in the crossroad moments of our lives. What's the definition of a crossroad? The definition of a crossroad is a crisis situation or point in time when a critical decision needs to be made. I'm going to say that again. The crossroad moment is when a crisis situation or a point in time when a critical decision needs to be made. Maybe some of you today watching, you have found yourself at a crossroad moment. There are critical decisions that need to be made in your life right now. Due to your finances, where you live, your livelihood, all of that, much of that for many of us has been greatly affected with what we're facing with the shelter in place. And here across even America and the nations around the world, we find ourselves in a global pandemic that has not only affected us on a health level, it's affected us on an economy level. So we can definitely classify this as a crossroad moment. But friends, I want you to know it's the decisions that we make in the crossroad moments of our life that determine your legacy. I'm going to say that one more time because that's where we're going today. This is what I want to focus right in on is the decisions that you make in this moment, COVID-19, right here in 2020, in the midst of a very challenging and unprecedented time. We've never been here before, but I want you to know it may seem out of control, but our God is still in control. And the decisions that you make in this moment, in these months, in these days, in these weeks will determine your legacy. It is so important that you understand the significance of the posture and the response in the time of the crossroad moments. See, he, I want to focus in, we're talking about Naomi, of course, because it's her husband and her sons that were have, have died. But what I really want to take some time for in this teaching and my time left with you today is to really focus on Ruth and Orpah, the two daughter-in-laws, because it was their responses that I feel like God is going to begin to teach and begin to instruct even you and I's response in the midst of a crossroad moments. Because here's Ruth and here's Orpa, two women in the midst of crisis that have to make two decisions. And it's their two decisions. Friends, I want you to catch this. Two decisions that lead to two very different legacies. Because friends, your life is bigger than just you in this moment. Your life is about the generations. Your life is about your children, your children's children's children, and even your great great grandchildren. I want you to know that you have a generation looking to you, that the decisions you make now in your life affect the bloodline and the destiny and the legacy that God has ordained to come through you. And this is the same for Orpah and for Ruth, two women, two decisions that need to be made that lead to two different legacies. See, here in this moment, they're living in Moab. Remember, Ruth and Orpah are actually at home. It would make logical sense because they've lost their husbands. Remember, they're vulnerable. And a widow at that time is reliant on friends and family to take care of them. So catch this. Wouldn't it make sense? Wouldn't it be the logical, the reasonable thing to actually stay where your, fit, <coughs> excuse me, your friends and your family are? 
stay home, stay in your normal community, stay in the community. That would be the logical thing. But see, Naomi, who's their mother-in-law, and she's the one that worships God. She's the one that worships Yahweh. She's a, of the children of God. She's going back to where she's come. She's going back to her homeland to be with her friends and family because she has property there. She has inheritance there that she knows that there is a better chance of her being taken care of there. So here are these two young women at the beginning of their lives. They still have an opportunity possibly to get married, but they don't know. And if they go with their mother-in-law, Naomi, they're a Moabite. Well, the children of God, the people of God, didn't like the Moabites. So there was a real chance they would be discriminated against. There was a real chance they would be, be forever shunned, never accepted. They would always be ostracized and rejected from, from Naomi, their mother-in-law's community from her people. So it would be a risk to go to a place where you are a foreigner because in the midst of the crossroad, in the midst of the crisis, the natural response would be like, stay with my community, stay with my family and my friends. Well, Naomi certainly thought they should stay back, but here's what you have to understand. Both Ruth and Orpah are Moabites, which means they worshiped false gods. They had a culture of worship that was sexually deviant and perverted. They did sexual acts and horrible things that I don't necessarily need to get into today, but I want you to understand, these were people that opposed God and Yahweh. So they were not covenantal people. They were actually people that lived out of rebellion, not out of place of obedience and covenant. And so here these women actually have a choice of faith to make. They have a choice to decide who's going to be their Lord. They're, they're making a legacy decision more than they even understand and recognize because by following Naomi, they were choosing to be a part of the people of God. If they stayed in Moab and, and continued in their current culture that was familiar to them, they would be a part of a culture that was anti-God and worshiping false gods. So why is that so important? Because friends, because when you're in a crossroad moments, the decisions you make are affecting the legacies that you leave. And here or Orpah and here Ruth are at one of the most tragic, most difficult places in their life. They thought their life was full of promise and destiny. They believed they were promised children. Neither of them had children at this time. So all these hopes and dreams and things that they had in their heart, they don't know if they're going to come to pass. And they have a key, key decision to make in this moment. What's the difference? Why did one stay, as we read in scripture in Ruth 1 just a moment ago, why did one, Orpah, choose to leave? And why did Ruth choose to go? That's the question. And I think when we study these two women, we can get that answer. See, when we read in scripture, as they were actually packed their bags, and scripture says they were going with their mother-in-law, Naomi. What did Naomi begin to do as soon as the journey begun? She began to say, what are you doing? Why are you coming with me? I have nothing to give you. The Lord's hand has turned against me. I have no husband. I have no son to give you. I have no livelihood. I can't take care of you. I've got nothing. Why in the world would you come with me? You're making it harder on yourself. You're making it more difficult on your life. I can't guarantee. Go get security. Go get comfort. Go get convenience. You girls stay home. Don't come with me. Their own mother-in-law is telling them it. Isn't it amazing when someone is riddled with grief, when someone is riddled with fear, and some of us know this because we've been listening on the broadcasts of America and beyond. There's a lot of fear that's happening right now. When you hear a narrative of negativity, of fear, of disappointment, disillusionment, it's amazing how persuasive fear can be. It's amazing how persuasive great grief can be. But I want you to know that if you do not allow the grief of someone, the fear of someone, the narrative of the enemy to disrupt where God has called you, you can can secure the legacy he has within you. But you see, Orpah heard the, the, the false reasoning of her, her mother-in-law. She allowed the fear and the grief to become her narrative because she was listening to what Naomi was saying and she probably began to think, well, my goodness, you're right. You, you don't have a husband for me. 
You don't have a livelihood. Why I am choosing a harder road. Naomi's narrative of grief and disappointment and even fear began to become Orpah's narrative and then became her truth. She allowed that to be her rationale to stay back. So rather than go with her mother-in-law to the people of God, she thought, you know what, you're right. So what does scripture say Orpah did? She said, it says, Orpah went and kissed Naomi and then she went to back to Moab and stayed with her people. But what's interesting about Ruth, Ruth listened to the leading of the Lord because Ruth had committed covenant with her mother-in-law. When she married her husband, she married the family. And so when crisis kicked in, remember, these girls are hearing the exact same narrative. Naomi's speaking to Orpah and she's speaking to Ruth. So they're both hearing it. But it's interesting that two people can hear the same thing and their responses can be totally different. Rather than actually allowing, like Orpah, the narrative of grief and fear to actually detour and actually send her back to Moab where God had actually delivered her from, Let's think about that for a moment. Here's Ruth here in the exact same fear and grief. And rather than it, it take her off course, rather than it distract her, she actually allowed the grief and the fear to reinforce, oh no, I'm going with you. Oh no, I'm going to the people of my God. No, I'm actually going to say that your people are my people. Your God is my God. Now, scholars and theologians would say that was actually Ruth's conversion moment. That was a moment where she actually can shifted totally from being a Moabite culture worshiping false gods to actually being a worshiper of Yahweh. Why? Because in the times of grief and crisis, we see what's really in us. Isn't that true? That when you're in a crisis and when you're in the midst of grief and fear is all around you, friends, we don't have to look too far to find some examples of that in today's culture. You turn on the news right now and we are riddled with stats and we are riddled with fear. You choose what your narrative is and you choose what you listen to. Friends, I want you to get in a posture where you allow every time the enemy throws fear at you, every time the enemy attempts to throw grief at you or a negative statistic at you, I want you to allow it to put your heels in the spirit and actually get rooted in who God is because it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at you. It doesn't matter what crisis comes your way. It doesn't matter what detour happens in your life. I don't care if your finances have been affected and that's not coming from a place of lack of empathy. I just want you to know God is your provider. He is your source. He's the one that's going to come through. I know that right now it looks different than what you thought it was going to be, but friends, I feel the spirit of God telling me to tell you right now, get hope raised up within you. Start declaring and prophesying sign who God is in this time. You're not going to give in to fear or grief because when we are the children of God, which we are, we are more than conquerors. We are victorious. And I want you to know that God's not finished yet because if you have breath in your body, your story's not done being written. Don't allow two, two months of disruption, of un unexpected detour in your life to reroute you from the destiny that God has in your life. See, Ruth understood. And what did she do? She reinforced, and I said this before, but I'll say it again. She allowed that moment to actually solidify covenant. She allowed the crisis to define the covenantal moment. See, Orpah went for convenience. Ruth went for obedience. She was like, you called me to these people. You called me to my mother-in-law. You called me to this family. You called me to be a worshiper of you. When we choose covenant, it is often inconvenient and at times looks illogical. Have you ever had the Lord ask you to do some things that felt illogical? It didn't make sense, but you knew it was God. See, it didn't make sense for Ruth to leave the people that would take care of her. It didn't make sense for her to leave what potentially she already knew some probably other men that gladly would have married her, right? It didn't make sense for her in the time of crisis to start over. No way. But when God is writing your story, 
He doesn't do things by human reasoning. He does things because he sees a greater narrative over your life, friends. I want you to know that this is merely, these two months of interruption is merely a blip on your lifetime. God is working a larger story. There's a larger narrative at work in your life right now. Don't lose sight of the bigger picture. The enemy wants to get really tunnel vision, but God today wants to open up your perception and perspective that he is at work. No matter what the world is saying, God is still in control and he is still at work. I think so much of what we can see between these two women, Ruth and Orpah, is their physical response to their mother-in-law in the moment of deciding, do I stay or do I go? Remember, Orpah, what did she do when she decided to go back to Moab? She decided to go back to what was convenient, what was familiar. She kissed Naomi. But Ruth, when she decided, no, I'm going to go, I'm leaving all that's familiar. I'm going to risk going and being a foreigner in a land where I don't know anyone. I'm going to risk starting over. I may be rejected. I may never be accepted. I might be choosing the harder path, but God, I fail you on this. You are now my God. So I'm choosing you. What did Ruth do? It says she clung to Naomi. Orpah kissed. Ruth clung. Now, why is that significant? Because I believe that your physical response often is a representation of your internal spiritual atmosphere. So many times when people come to church, and again, I'm not at all coming from a critical place, but I pastored for years. I've done schools of ministry, been on pastoral teams, associate pastor, executive pastor. I've been involved in the church a lot of my life. And often I would see people where wouldn't raise their hands, hands in pockets, they're not singing, but they're like, hey, I'm in church and I'm worshiping, but they're not opening up their mouth, they're not singing and hand, no, there's no expression. And they're like, well, I just like to be quiet and contemplate in God. But the problem with that is I've seen you at sporting events and I've seen you when your favorite music comes on. And there's often a physical response when you laugh or when you're excited or when you're cheering on your team or you got to get your next dance out because that new TikTok just came out, whatever it may be, right? I mean, it's funny how there's a natural physical response, but often when people are in the presence of God and they're uncomfortable with intimacy because there's still issues of lordship in their life. And when there's still an issue with lordship, you're a lot more comfortable kissing than clinging. Because when you are after intimacy, you have to cling. You can no longer kiss. Now, what's the difference? Kissing is fleeting. It's momentary. It's gone quick, but clinging. What did that represent? It represented I'm all in. I'm not going anywhere. You can't get rid of me. I don't care how hard it is, Naomi. I don't care about the grief. I don't care about the difficulty. I know I don't know these people. This is Ruth talking. I know I don't know these people. I know I might be choosing a harder road, road but your God is my God. Your people is my people. Stop telling me to leave. I'm not going anywhere. I'm clinging to you. It's a, it's a posture of desperation. It's a posture of being all in. See, in this hour, in this moment, friends, the world doesn't need any kissing Christians. When there's a crisis, when there's a desperate prayer need, oh, Jesus, can you, can you answer my prayer? Can you hear me? Can you come through? I'm scared. I need your peace right now. Kiss. It's momentary. It's fleeting. But I'm talking about being clean Christians that in the morning hours, in the first fruits of your day, you're on your face, you're in the word, you're praying, you're saying, God, I, I can't have my day without you being in the center of my day. I give you my life. I take communion. I come into covenant once again with you. Uh, Jesus, you have all of me. I hold nothing back. That's a clinging Christian. That's you, students at CFNI. That's you saying I'm all in. You chose to come to CFNI because you're a clinking follower of Jesus. See, Orpah kissed, Ruth clung. But I want you to know, it is so important in this hour, whatever you are clinging to is actually what you're going to come into. See, what we cling to 
is what we come into. Because of what Ruth clung to, she was able to come into the fullness of God in her life. Ruth clung to her covering, Naomi. She clung to covenant. She clung to God. And here's the cool story. Many of you already know this. Here's a cool story about Ruth. Here's the rest of her story. When she goes back with Naomi, she ends up marrying Boaz. He's like the most eligible bachelor. He's like the wealthy, handsome guy that everyone's wanting to marry. And he marries Ruth. And not only that, one of the greatest gifts that Boaz gave Ruth was that he took care of Naomi. So not only did he take care of Ruth, he also took care of the mother-in-law that she loved so dearly that she chose to stay in covenant with. I love that part of the story because friends, when we choose God, when we choose covenant like Ruth, not only do we get blessed, our family gets blessed. That's the cool thing about God is the blessings of God not only fall on your life, they fall on the lives of those around you. And I love that because Naomi was blessed because of the blessing of Ruth's obedience over convenience. See, I love that God then gave Ruth children. Remember, she, this woman, she wanted to be married. She wanted a family. She, she wanted the dreams of her heart. And God saw this, what looked like tragedy, what looked like a detour, what looked like an interruption was actually a, a launching point for her destiny. And so here's Ruth. She gets married to Boaz. She has children. And here's the craziest part of her story. She has Obed. And then Obed has Jesse. And you know who Jesse's son is? David. Okay, follow me here. Guys, I want you to catch this. Dial into this. Focus on this point because this is so important. Ruth is the great grandmother of King David. What? Okay, Ruth had Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse. Jesse had King David. Okay, so Ruth is the great grandmother of King David. So wait, what is the lineage that Jesus comes through? What? Ruth, Ruth's lineage. What? Here's this Moabite woman who's lost her husband, who chooses covenant, who goes with Naomi to be a foreigner in a land. She has no idea. She thinks she's choosing the harder life, but she says, I'm all in. She clung to covenant. And God, only God can write these crazy stories. In the midst of what looked like an absolute loss and time of dev devastation was the story that God was writing that she was going to be grafted into the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. What? Here's a Moabite woman who's desperate, lost, and broken, and she has a book written in the Bible that is still discipling us to this day. She's still a mother of the faith. Why? Because of the decision she made in Ruth 1 and the legacy that it released in her life. That's not all, friends. Here's what's really crazy. So God's like, read Ruth's life. I just shared it with you. Powerful, blows my mind. Only God can write these stories. But then God says to me, okay, Krista, research Orpah. What happened to Orpah? Remember, Orpah kissed, went back to Moab. And it says in scripture, excuse me, it says when I begin to read in commentary, scholars and theologians, that Orpah actually, when she went back to Moab, she married a man from the tribe of Gath. She ended up having four sons. One of her son's name was Goliath. Stop it. Goliath. Here's two women. Ruth one. Are you catching this? I'm so excited to share this with you. Okay. Ruth one. Orpa. Ruth. Orpa goes back to Moab. Her legacy, her lineage, that is a result of the decision she made at the crossroad moments of Ruth one. She then has a son named Goliath, who's the Philistine who opposes the people of God. Ruth has Jesse or Obed. And then Obed has Jesse. Jesse has King David. David, remember 1 Samuel 17, the, the, the battle between David and Goliath. Here is the legacy and the lineage of these two women from Ruth 1 are coming face to face once again. What? Here's this 
decision from these two women in Ruth 1, and it comes full circle in 1 Samuel 17. Why is this so significant? Because the same decision is having to be made once again. Covenant. Covenant. Friends, that's what this is all about, is covenant. How did David defeat Goliath? He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord, you uncircumcised Philistine. What is uncircumcised Philistine? What is that saying? It says you are not in covenant with God. Being uncircumcised meant you were not a covenant people. And here David is coming and saying, I am of covenant. I come to you not in myself. I don't come to you because of what I carry or my weapon tree. My weapon tree is my covenant. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And so David didn't care that this guy was a giant and he was a grown man, an older man. And here's this young, ruddy kid that people are looking at thinking he's arrogant. He was actually called arrogant by his brother for even thinking he could defeat Goliath. But see, David wasn't arrogant. He was a child of covenant. Ooh, and when people don't understand covenant, they might think you are uh, too faith-filled or too radical or too extreme. But friends, when you are covenant people, it doesn't matter what battle you are facing. It doesn't matter how big the Goliaths are of your life. It doesn't matter what it, it, MSNBC or Fox News or CNN, it doesn't matter what people are saying. I want you to know that God defeats every Goliath, not because of who we are, but because who he is in us. And see, David David understood he was a covenant people and he understood that because his great grandmother Ruth modeled it. That it wasn't about convenience, it was always about obedience and covenant. Because when you are a covenant kid, you always choose obedience. What does David's name mean? David's name means beloved friend. See, Ruth had chosen to become covenant, therefore she's a friend of God. When we ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, he's the Lordship of our life, we have the honor and privilege to be his friend. But Goliath's name actually means without cover. See, when Orpah walked away from Naomi in Ruth 1, she chose to leave her covering. She chose to be with people that were not in covenant. And because she chose to be without cover, and because she chose to not be in covenant, ultimately, and it says, and this is incredible, in Deuteronomy 23.3, Deuteronomy 23.3, it says, no Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants for 10 generations may be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. There was such an abomination over the lineage of Orpah, they weren't even allowed into the, the assembly of the Lord. She so wanted to be secure. She so wanted family. She so wanted to be comfortable that she chose to be out of covenant. She actually had a price. And friends, if you have a price, the enemy will gladly pay it. When we are covenant people, we cannot have a price because the price has already been paid by what Jesus did on the cross. And the price was his blood shed for you and I, that when we choose to be inconvenienced for the sake of covenant, the legacy that is released in our lives will have an immeasurable mark on the destiny of those that come behind us, all because of the decisions we make in this hour at this time. Do not underestimate the significance of your posture in this this hour at this time. Don't allow yourself to get sucked into the fear, the narrative, the grief of what's going on around you. Friends, let the children of God arise with faith and confidence. Why? Because we are a people of covenant and we are a people where our God always comes through. He defeats every single Goliath that thinks it's in our way. I want you to know and I want you to be encouraged today that God is inviting you right now at a crossroad moment in your life. You might be finding yourself in times of loss, loss of finances, loss of relationship. For some of you, loss of health. There are many people, and I'm not minimizing the severity or the seriousness of the situation, 
But there's also other things in people's lives that are going on. Hardships in marriages, strained relationships, hopelessness. Some of you might even be struggling with depression today. I want you to know God is going to come through even right now and defeat every Goliath that when you call on the covenant that you have access to because you are a king's kid, because you're a covenantal kid, that the things that are taunting you like the Goliath was taunting the Davids in 1 Samuel 17, he was mocking him. He was taunting him. I heard the Lord say, as the children of God arise and come in the name of the Lord, that the Goliaths in this hour in your life are going to be defeated. Don't underestimate who you are in him because friends, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Allow the spirit of God to rise up in you today. I pray you are encouraged at this time. I pray and I believe that in this moment and in this hour, it could not be more pivotal, the posture that we take at the crossroad moments we find ourselves in. Friends, you are so valuable to the Father. And I I encourage you, close your eyes even now. Ask for a fresh encounter, a fresh infilling, because I want you to know our God is a God of hope. There should be no area of our lives that we are hopeless, because when God is in control, we know in the end he will work all things together for his good and his glory. And that, my friends, is what it is to be a covenant kid. I bless you today, and I pray you experience a deeper place in your walk with Jesus.